Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Institute for Government. Uh, this uh, Wednesday lunchtime. Very good that so many of you are enjoying uh, Institute for Government lunch. Uh, I'm Jill Rutter. I'm Program Director for Brexit and the Institute for Government. Uh, we have, for a huge amount of time, been toying with the idea of running a series, uh, apart from our normal sort of Brexit work on what is happening tomorrow in Parliament and things like that, on what are the opportunities from Brexit. But it's never seemed quite the moment to do the opportunities from Brexit discussion. But I think one of the things that most people agree on is if there are opportunities anywhere as we leave the EU, it's in the realm of agriculture, not least because the UK has chafed under the yoke of the cap, uh, a policy designed not with British interests at heart when we exceeded in the early 1970s. It's sort of like chafed to move the cap into a better direction but been uh, not necessarily totally happy with its outcomes, either for farming, the way in which farms are managed, the way in which farms are regulated, or indeed for the environment. And some of DEFRA's most dramatic statistics are for the decline in things like farmland and woodland birds uh, since the uh, 1960s. So this seemed like a very opportune moment to open up the discussion to ask what might the future be for food and farming after Brexit, and we're trying to focus on the longer term beyond the will Sainsbury's still have crisps on the shelves uh, on March 30th, though we can get into a bit of uh, the potential disruption in the event of a no-deal Brexit if we have to and must. So we're absolutely delighted to have a really, really stellar panel here at the Institute for Government. So kicking off, uh, we're going to have uh, Minette Batters, the president of the National Farmers Union, anyone who's worked anywhere near DEFRA, and I am in that things, just knows how influential, well-connected and powerful the NFU is. And indeed, talking to various people from other countries who negotiate trade, they always say, well, lots of businesses aren't that well organized. They you know, don't really pay that much attention. But then they're the farmers, so they're likely to be very, very big players, uh, not just in uh, agriculture policy here, but also future trade policy. So, Minette Bass has been president of the NFU since this time last year, is going to set out where she thinks the big opportunities are on food and farming after Brexit and what maybe some of the risks or concerns are. And then we're going to have two responses. On my far left is Dame Clannis Stacey, in, who in her day job is Chief Inspector of Probation. And you might say, isn't that enough for one person to be sorting out? Um, but she was uh, tasked by Michael Gove with having a look and answering the question, if we are freed from some of the constraints of the cap and the rural payment system, could we not regulate farms more efficiently and effectively in the future? And that led to the Stacey Review, whose recommendations were published. Clinton says that the government's accepted those recommendations. Uh, so she's going to talk about that sort of regulatory opportunity. Um, where that might go. And Gladys actually also has form in this area because when I knew her, Defra, she was heading up the Animal Health Agency. And then in the middle is Mike Clark. Mike is Chief Executive of the Royal Society of Protection of Birds. We did some work with the RSPB last year on common frameworks and managing devolution after Brexit, particularly in the area of uh, agriculture and environment policy. Uh, and one of the big questions is, is this going to be the best news yet for the environment? or should we be more worried about the threat? So Mike is going to say what he thinks needs to happen to make sure that Brexit is great for birds and the wider environment, because obviously RSPB is not just focused on birds. Tweet along. Uh, I shouldn't say that after mentioning birds, but hashtag IFG Brexit, join the conversation, uh, do all that. We can't see what you're tweeting. Uh, so forgive us if we don't do your questions. We're going to set off. We're going to have a bit of a chat on the panel, and then there'll be loads of time for all your questions. So without further ado, have been taking far too long. Minette. Well, Jill, thank you very, very much indeed um, for the invite to, to come here today. And I, I think it's really important um, to congratulate the Institute for Government on, the, on this vital role that you are playing. We, we really, within the NFU, feel it, it is incredibly important. Um, and you've picked up in your latest report, I guess, a number of key concerns for the farming industry. And for me, it's, re it's really sort of covered off by three words at the moment. You know, this is about risk, it is about opportunity, and it is about change. But if I, I sort of cover off the risk, if you don't mind, because I yep. think the risk ultimately leads us on to where the opportunities lie. 
and what the change will be like. And if we don't all collectively focus on, on the risk and what we need, the chances are we, we miss out on what I believe is a seismic opportunity um, for uh, the United Kingdom and indeed food production and the environment. Um, so, first of all, a, avoiding a no deal. Um, you know, there is a, a deal effectively on the table which the NFU has cautiously um, supported. And I guess I, I want to also bring to life to you how you know, the NFU can help um, British farmers effectively navigate Brexit. But just touching on no deal in the first instance. Um, and it is hard to know here. I, did, I don't know how many of you saw it. I did the, the, the interview with Sophie Ridge uh, at the weekend on my frozen farm that is now not frozen. Um, but you know, the challenge, we could well be under, in a no deal situation, we could well be under a trade embargo for animal uh, and animal products. You know, that, that is a real reality. When we speak to Commissioner Hogan, he will say we are a boring rules-based club and on the 30th of March, you will become a third country and you will deal under most favoured nation status. And on that basis, for animal and animal products, you will have to have checks that could last six months, could last longer. For the organic sector, that could be nine months, could be longer. Now, there's a bit of a judgment call in this as to whether you want to say that is just project fear, you know, that will not happen. We're fully aligned. The EU can pass that emergency legislation. But the point being, it's for the EU to decide that. It's not our decision. It's the EU that will decide it. Um, we then come on to imports. And next week, hopefully, government is going to provide some clarity of what the tariff uh, situation will look like for imports but we also have to recognize here and this is something that we don't recognize that much but I promise you other countries across the world do so New Zealand Australia Argentina Canada America all see this as what they would call an untapped market a market of massive potential going forward 66 predominantly wealthy consumers we just take it as a given. But, but this really is, uh, I would say, the, the game changer for all of us. In a no-deal situation, one thing any responsible government will want to avoid is seeing food inflation. So there's a talk of we wouldn't want to see more than 5% absolute maximum. Well, given a no-deal, the friction, everything else that will be an outcome of that, 5% looks very optimistic. But what will the tariff wall look like? Or indeed, will there be a tariff wall on food at all? Will they keep it just absolutely flat lining so we can get food in? Now, of course, it doesn't just stop with the EU. Uh, you take that decision. You have to have uh, fairness to all. You have to give that opportunity to the rest of the world as well. So the, the whole tariff situation and what government comes out with next week, um, uh, fuel, a fire has been fueled again by Dr. Fox. <laughs> on, on his view of tariffs, but you know it, that will be very interesting. Um, of course, all our critical dependencies are animal medicines, 95% produced in the EU, seeds, fertilizers, chemicals, um, a total reliance on that Dover Calais route for vital inputs coming in. Uh, you know, it's easy to dismiss that. It wouldn't take much to bring um, the dairy industry to a total and utter standstill to a welfare crisis if we cannot get those medicines in. What does it look like? What is the tariff situation on that? that, that that's a big part of this. And, and we can't not have this conversation around risk without talking about future uh, workforce. So seasonal workers on just red alert at the moment, every grower in the country is saying we desperately need certainty. We need clarity of thinking from government. All this talk of just a high skilled workforce who is going to pick these crops that are growing in the ground right now that we know the British consumer desperately wants to see more of? Now, yes, we can automate, we can mechanise much more, but it's going to have to be transitional. So we must have certainty as soon as possible. Um, for seasonal workers, the whole permanent workforce, I, I think, is a massive issue, not just for our sector, for the care sector, for hospitality. We've actively encouraged um, British people away from these jobs, um, and we've become very, very reliant on seeing higher productivity rates through what I would say has been a fantastic European workforce. What does the future look like? So three seismic planks of change in legislation, uh, trade, immigration, and finally, the bit I wanted to touch on last of all is the agricultural bill. Um, this uh, life-changing for my sector, it's, it's a landmark piece of legislation, equally as important as the Treaty of Rome that underpins the objectives of the CAP, 
and the 1947 Act. And we believe it is so important and fundamental to our future. It is landmark. Um, and it should, on that basis, it is an agricultural bill. And I'm hoping that Mike will very much agree with me here because it, it needs to be linked to the land. You know, it is really important that a future budget is linked to the land and not allowed to be hived off into different areas. At the moment, this relies on an amendment to make sure that this bill is an agricultural bill, is linked to the land, is not a given. Those monies effectively could be spent on anything. And I did say to the Prime Minister, you do keep saying the CAP has failed our farmers, but I said this is a landmark piece of legislation with no commitment to farming or indeed the 72% of farmed landscape at the moment. So that's an important amendment. Um, the second one is the piece on the standards. You know, we have continually said to Michael Gove, you know, what will you look to do on the standards? We want uh, to be clear on this. We want him to look to bring a UK-wide group together to agree what we would want on animal welfare, environmental protection and food safety. To agree a black and white policy statement on what our free trade agreement is going to offer on agriculture. That question, as far as I'm concerned, sits in the warm words territory at the moment, and it does need putting in writing. And thirdly, the multi-annual budget. The cap was many things, and it had to fit around many different countries, but it had a, a long-term financial commitment. We do not have the option of a multi-annual budget within the bill at the moment. So if I could pick headline amendments, I think there are, looking at Vicky Hurd here, I think there are very, very important amendments that could come. If I could pick the headlines, those would be it. Finally, on the policy, the big opportunity. Um, I think we have to be very, very clear here that this has to deliver a multitude, as many public benefits as we can probably factor in. So you will be told time and time again that food is not a public good, but I think food production you know, must be in here, not necessarily as a public good, but it has to feature in the policy. It has to be about green energy. It has to be about delivering more for the environment and biodiversity. Um, it has to have as many things built within it as it possibly can, because we know that we live in times of massive austerity. We know that there will be further public spending reviews, and we know it'll be a massive challenge to deliver on a multi-annual budget. So this has to be a business plan that really stacks up, is totally robust and delivers, as I say, as many things as it can. Now, many of you will have heard what I said at the Oxford Farming Conference that we believe we absolutely have to pick up the gauntlet on delivering net zero in agriculture. Agriculture is currently 10% uh, of um, uh, carbon uh, greenhouse gases. So livestock is 5% at the moment. How do we have incentivization for smarter farming practices, investment in new R&D that ultimately means that we are uh, effectively producing more food because we're farming smarter, but we are continually impacting less. And what we would like to see as an NFU is uh, effectively a net zero pilot. So we have um, the NELMS pilots going on at the moment. We would like to see a net zero pilot based on a catchment-based approach, um, because I think there's a real opportunity, and, and I absolutely applaud what uh, Dame Greta Stacey has done um, with the ambition to deliver uh, a sole regulator. That sole regulator must be able to incentivise. We have a challenge in our sectors, particularly if I take dairy as an example, we do have, because we've invested the cap, I believe, badly in many places, uh, we have an underinvested dairy sector. We have not had any investment in on-farm infrastructure since the 80s, where we have uh, slurry storage that is failing. I believe that that regulator must be able to incentivise rather than just put people out of business. If you look at net zero on a whole catchment approach, it is absolutely possible to have that incentivised policy that effectively brings um, what we talk about as productivity. If I could rename it under another word, I would, because it is totally misunderstood. It is deemed as, as producing more. It's about smarter farming that continually impacts less. And that, for us, is what net zero is all about. Yes, you know that you can do a massive amount with doubling the width of your hedges, but you also know that this has to be a multifaceted approach if we're going to deliver on net zero. So I, I think the opportunities are huge. I would just finish, Jill, with saying one thing. I was out in Paris yesterday meeting with the FNCA, FNSEA, the French uh, equivalent of me. So talking to Christiane Lambert, who is uh, the female French president. Um, 
a totally different relationship now. You know, we've always been competitive around the cap, so the French hanging on to their bit, the UK hanging on to their bit, and the French saying, and you never know how much you're loved until you're leaving, <laughs> you know, the French saying, we will miss you so much, you know, you've been the pragmatic voice between Germany and France. Uh, I'm fascinated in what we're saying about a food strategy, the need to, need to have food strategy before you develop agricultural policy, the widening gap that we've had between environment policy, food policy and farming policy. So I think if we get this right, there is a real opportunity for the UK to be this sort of global hybrid player that is an influencer for the good. Um, and that doesn't mean that we have to liberalise on trade and sacrifice all of our good work. So I've probably had my 10 minutes You've plus had your 10 minutes, but some. I just wanted to pick up on your trip to Paris, just, mm -hmm. uh, just quickly. So when you're talking to your French counterpart, do you get the sense that they're putting pressure on their government to say, don't be ridiculous, we export an awful lot of dairy across the channel into the UK, yeah. all this talk was on cliff edge, no deal, you know, things. That's a nightmare for us too. You can't let that happen. Or do they just sort of say integrity of the single market is yeah. you know, more important? Jill, a, a absolutely brilliant question. So part of my job, I would say, has been about relationships mm. everywhere. It's been about maintaining our relationships across Europe. So we've done 18 bilateral meetings in the last five months. Um, and it has been incredibly important to say to those member states, we must have a deal. It is in your interests. It is in our interests. And um, I think I can tell you what, what the French <laughs> president said yesterday. She said, I want to put out a press release today that says we as Europe's farmers are united in our shared future of trade. And, and the farmers are united even if the politicians are not. And I would say there is real consensus, not only within the UK farmers, but within European farmers, that we must have a deal. It is really detrimental to both sides on every level for the UK to crash out without a deal. And we've absolutely made that case. Mm. And I'm very confident mm. they are lobbying their governments to say, you have to be pragmatic. Mm. We have to have a deal. Of course, this is about the withdrawal mm. agreement. This yeah. is not about the future relationship. <laughs> no, which and that all starts in yeah. April, hopefully. Right, that's, that's very interesting. If not the German car is coming to our rescue, maybe it's the French farmers, slightly implausibly. But anyway, but we all know they're good at getting their own way. So, without further ado, we've heard, uh, heard so far that the NFU is very enthusiastic about some of these ideas in, uh, in Gladys Stacey's review of all overhauling this sort of muddle of farm regulation with, I think, five different DEFRA bodies doing it, people all tripping over each other, farmers not quite clear what to do. So, Gladys, do you want to just... Take us through what actually do you see as the potential if we're liberated from some of the constraints of the way in which we have to administer the CAP and farm regulation so thank under you the very CAP. Much. And, and thank you for inviting me here to talk about regulation. I, I like regulation. It makes me very happy. But <laughs> I know that a lot of people, just their eyes glaze over when you mention the word. So I'm always glad to get a chance to talk about it and hope don't bore you uh, too much. So my view is that as we leave the EU, assuming that do, then um, there's a, a good opportunity actually for regulation to work better for farmers. So we can have a more joined up approach and some of the really pernickety rules that drive farmers nuts uh, can certainly go. Uh, but I think the key point is that whether we leave or not, now is the time to think about regulating farming in much better, more modern day ways anyway, because we've been stuck in a bit of a time warp not least because of the constraints of, of CAP, but that's not, not the only reason. So I say that we can change the way that we regulate, that uh, there's a lot of hard and fast rules out there at the moment. I think about 175 statutory and other instruments that are setting those rules out. Very unusual. And I'm saying that actually what government now wants from farming and actually what many farmers actually want uh, from farming. It's much more likely to be brought about by much more straightforward regulation, by more targeted guidance that actually makes sense to farmers, by the provision of advice to farmers, as it is often a solitary uh, job, and a more considered approach and more consistent approach to, to enforcement as well. So, you know, really turning a big ship around in the way that we regulate. And we should certainly, now is the right time, given developments in the last couple of years, now is the right time to harness uh, remote surveillance and other modern technologies more to check for compliance and 
reduce the overall burden and sort of presence, you know, austere presence of regulation. And we should as well work with the sector to get on top of systemic issues such as uh, some of the endemic animal diseases, because some things we will not be able to do simply with a set of rules. We need to work much more closely uh, with the sector to, to get things right. So um, I am recommending, as you say, mm. that government creates a new independent regulator. I make what I think are compelling arguments actually for independent regulation and arm's length uh, from government. And I, and I recommend that we regulate in new ways uh, and signal now, actually, to farmers government's intention to regulate differently uh, in future. So to do that, to regulate well, new regulatory powers actually need to be enacted. None of the existing bodies uh, can do it on their current suite of powers. Uh, so we need uh, the enactment of a new regulator. And of course, that raises questions for DEFRA and its configuration, and no doubt some difficult decisions need to be made with the future in mind there. But we need to join things up really and regulate farms more supportively and as a whole, as farms, as farmed land, rather than regulate the individual issues associated with farms as we do at the moment in such a bit piece way. That is the wrong end of the telescope uh, from a regulatory perspective. So. Um, as I understand it, the government accepts the thrust of these uh, rec rec recommendations that I've made in this report and intends to consult. So its intention at the moment, I think, is to create a new regulator and to consult on the regulatory approach and also the relationship with environmental land management and contracts and payment there. Because my argument is that uh, the regulator needs to use the entire spectrum of regulation so at one end of the spectrum, when you've got really serious risks of harm and harms materialising, so exotic animal disease is one I would be familiar with, you need some hard and fast rules there. You're not debating them or arguing them, you're imposing them, and, and that's it, the movement controls and so on. But actually many of the things that government now wants from farming are at the other end of the spectrum. So if we do want to restore our hedgerows, for example, um, then we do need to think of other regulatory approaches. If you think of regulation as one thing, it is this. It is not a set of rules. It is whatever you need to do to change behaviours where they need to change. That's what you're thinking as a regulator. What needs to change? How do I get those things to change? And at this end of the regulatory spectrum, you much more about advice, guidance, and yes, incentivisation. And indeed, picking up the slurry point, um, one of my recommendations is that government does consider some sort of grant aid for repairs or replacement of slurry uh, storage facilities now because about 50% of them are plainly uh, failing. And actually, you know, you, if you think about what can you do to, to make a substantial change to the quality of water and the environment in this country, that must be way up you know, towards the top of the list. So, Yes, as Manette says, it needs to be linked to land. Uh, Manette, you also, just one or two other points you raised, I'll just pick up to finish mm -hmm. with. One is, you mentioned the need for a multi-annual budget. And of course, this is a frustration for all areas of public endeavour. <laughs> what are we going to be living on on the 2nd of April, uh, for example, with spending reviews getting ever more distant? Uh, but actually, I do make the point in the report that farming, more so than many other areas of endeavour, <laughs> needs to be looked at over a period of years. You know, income fluctuates so significantly from year to year, as does investment, as does currency exchange levels and so on. And so it's only over a period of years that many farmers can see whether they're making a profit or loss. There is a strong case, in other words, to taking a longer financial view of farming than perhaps some other more regular areas of endeavour. On um, trade and standards, there's some very interesting questions for government here. So obviously some trade issues and related standards are deeply political matters and a regulator wants to kind of steer, steer clear of that where possible. But a lot of the, the requirements now I would suggest, or one of the key requirements, is that we must be sufficiently flexible and agile. You know, one thing we can learn from other countries that have gone through trade shocks and changes is that they do need to change 
their standards or regulations sometimes almost overnight in order to protect trade. And I would certainly urge government to bear that strongly in mind, that you need to be able to flex here and be agile to support farming and, and to support trade. And indeed, one of my recommendations is that the regulator needs to have a set statement of purpose, the reason why we're regulating. It needs to be in statute, and that should, yes, cover maintaining and enhancing animal health and welfare, maintaining and enhancing the natural environment, but also facilitating trade. Because you don't regulate farming to kill it. You know, you, you simply don't. And these things have to be kept in proper balance, these things. Whereas at the moment we've got interest groups competing in each of them. And that's why independent regulation has such a lot to offer, in my view, because the balance can be struck openly and you can account to Parliament for why and how you did it, indeed you must do so. So for me that third leg, if you like, of facilitating trade will become so uh, precious and important. And indeed, I recommend that government considers that the regulator should itself be able to set standards, to hold the ring, pretty much as Minette has mentioned. And just lastly on that, um, it will be important the regulator has an influence with trading partners. So let's say, for example, we do have arrangements with Europe and we do have a common rule book. I've yet to see exactly what this common rule book has in it, incidentally, or how far it goes. It seems a convenient notion at the moment. Um, but we know that the rules at the moment set within Europe uh, define not only what a standard is to be met, but then how it is to be checked. And that is most unusual in regulatory terms. I've never seen it in the various areas I've regulated in. And I would be guarding against that with my life because it constrains your regulatory approach if you're told you've got to get out in a field with a GDP system and a tape measure every year, we're stuck you know, do, doing it. So it is really important that whoever is setting standards, that the right expertise and real knowledge is in there and that standards are set at the appropriate level and they can flex and change quickly if needs be to facilitate um, trade. I've probably had my 10 minutes rant okay. there, so I'll, I'll stop now. So, Clintus, just, just a quick question for you. We know that one of the things that some of the northern European farmers are worried about, about allowing uh, Minette's members to continue with tariff-free access, is that we have different standards in the UK and therefore they don't face a level playing field that the UK can undercut our standards. But I'm just wondering whether, it, whether you've actually sort of calculated the potential benefit, not from having different standards, but better administered standards. Mm. Because if you're dramatically reducing administrative burden on British farmers, you're giving them a bit of a leg up. Is that going to be a big issue with the farmers in the Netherlands or in Denmark who are saying, well, you know, we're facing an intolerable burden. We can't let these better regulated Brits into our market on the sort of, you know, level footing basis because the stated review has given them such a competitive advantage. I mean, are you talking big money in terms of benefits here or, uh, well, or just a bit less hassly life and a bit more okay. free time? So we know, the last time we looked at the burden of regulation for farming in any definitive way was back in 2012 when the National Audit Office mm. calculated, roughly speaking, that the average farm was, I think, earning about 55k and the cost of inspection alone was about 5k, so, you know, 10%. Mm. Now, inspection is, is the immediate face of regulation mm. for farmers, and at the moment it's fairly sporadic and irritating. You know, you can get mm. inspected several times a year or not for five years, and it's very difficult to join that up and make that fundamentally better without some big mm. systemic changes. But for me, um, I think a new regulator would be going down, frankly, the farm path as often, but for much more constructive reasons. You know, one of the tests for the new regulator is, is it welcomed on farm? Yeah. If it is going on farm to say, well, actually, you're mm. doing pretty well, but actually, your neighbour's better at that, and you know, this mm. is how you, mm. if you're benchmarking, in other words, and providing advice on where you might want to make some investment or not, mm. where you're above the bar and below, I think it becomes, regulation becomes, maybe it's the same overall burden, mm. I don't know, it's hard to tell, mm. but it becomes more constructive, more helpful, more beneficial for the farmer who's interested not just in in productivity mm. in a pure commercial mm. sense, but the wider environmental impact. If we're trying to meet the sort of um, goals mm. and aims that Minette is mentioning, it turns around the nature of regulation, I think. 
two other things about this trade relationship. You know, one is that we have, I think, we state, and I believe it actually, that some of our standards are the best in the world. And we sometimes hear people talking about notions of, say, a gold standard or lifting this or that. I'm actually more interested in whether these standards are met. Um, regulators mm. are. You know, we mm. want to know if they're met. We know, we say in our report, that the Environment Agency, without a risk model, will be visiting farms once every 200 years. You know, that doesn't give the public a great deal of confidence. If 50% of our slurry tanks are not doing the job they should, that doesn't give me confidence mm. either. I think the immediate issue for us as a country, actually, is put your money where your mouth is and make sure you're saying the right thing. These standards are mm. relevant. They're there for a purpose. They need to be met. And then we can worry about what others think of it. OK. Mike, um, from what Minette was saying on the sort of bill, uh, it sounds like sort of environmental NGOs. We know there's been this slightly bizarre uh, and unexpected uh, unity of purpose between the Environment Secretary and the <coughs> environmental NGOs, which perhaps wasn't anticipated when Michael Gove was appointed, that, it's, that you sort of really hijacked what's supposed to be an agriculture bill and made it an environment bill by another name. Uh, and that's why Minette needs to bring it back to actually say agriculture is actually about agriculture, not about the environment. But, uh, but what do you see as the uh, well, actually, risks and opportunities? Actually, uh, well, I'll, uh, I'm <laughs> going to reframe the exam question in a moment, but um, I'm just, just picking up where you've started. Um, Actually, I thought when you were saying, you know, remarkable unity, you know, mm. is breaking out. I thought you were going to say with the NFU, actually. <laughs> um, you know, we're, we're tabling, it. We'll come, I'll come on to this perhaps maybe in debate. You know, we're tabling all supporting an amendment to the Agriculture mm. Bill, for example, which I want to mention in a moment. Um, so, and indeed, uh, I, I mean, I, and I would also say, I was just thinking, I'm not going to talk about the immediate no deal, but I should just say to you, we are facing up to this really right now. In the next few weeks, we have 21,000 livestock on our nature reserves. Over 100 of our nature reserves we farm. We do that in partnership with about 300 small businesses. About a third of that operation we do in hand. So um, it's only a surprise to those who don't recognise actually the coincidence of interest between farming and nature conservation, which has been around for a long while. But I think I'd really like to, you know, perhaps to help um, stimulate a bit more thinking. Um, Rather than kind of looking at this in a zero sum way, I'd like to pick up the brief on looking long term because I'm not much keen on a kind of zero sum win lose, repatriate, liberate. Um, because you, you know, the political reality may be changing in terms of our relationship to the EU. The physical reality is the environment is not leaving, our environment is not leaving the European Union. We can't change physical geography. And, you know, this is, I mean, frankly, why, for my, certainly my charity, we've been internationally facing for over 110 years. But, you know, right now, um, if you look at the way um, our environment is coupled, um, two weekends ago there were protests in Lyon, tens of thousands of people, about air quality. We're hearing that pretty regularly here. About half of our peak World Health Organization exceeded limits happen when we have air mass coming in from the European Union. But just to put the counterpoint, um, I still sit on a um, better regulation committee yeah. for the Commission, and one of my colleagues, her day job is for French local government, uh, Dutch local government, and she's um, been seconded onto their Brexit contingency planning, and one of the contingency risks that local yeah. government in the Netherlands is concerned about is water pollution coming from us. We can't decouple the environment. So I'd rather mm. than thinking mm. about risks mm. and opportunities, I'd rather think about what are some of the success criteria for a future collaborative relationship which we will need to have, however that might be. And I uh, just three things I could pick out. And indeed the first one um, you know very much picks up points that have been mentioned already. Um, you know, we are and this is about trade. So again I think we're in a bit of a false you know kind of eye, eye of the hurricane kind of lull mm. at the moment because most G7 economies, maybe most G20 economies, have a mature portfolio of trade agreements. We're decoupling, but we're going to have to recouple. And we're having a debate before we've actually connected with the realities of either what the future long-term relationship with the largest trading bloc in the world, e EU, but also with other trading um, nations around the world. And all those other countries, a lot of their domestic policy is driven 
by what those trade agreements. So we have to recognise that, yes, we have a fantastic opportunity at the moment, I think, to have some very refreshing debate in this country about what, what kind of country we want to be in the future. But I think we have to recognise, you know, there is no stable end state other than one where we're in negotiation with a number of parties, including the um, European Union, over what that might be. And in all of that, I think um, one of the acid tests, I almost think this is one of the litmus tests from an environmental point of view of what direction the government intends to take us in. Uh, that is the degree to which we have um, a requirement in our trade policy that we actually maintain the standards that I think command very high public support, whether that's for the environment, whether it's animal welfare, public safety, and that that actually is something if we are committed to, we would see the Agriculture Bill amended. And this is one of the instances, CLA, RSPB, NFU, and many others are supporting an EFRA committee amendment to put that in. But I almost think that's a bit of an acid mm. test of intent at the moment, because it's all very well having fantastic enabling mm. legislation. Mm. But um, today we've just published, um, you can have a look on um, our, our blog, uh, Martin Harbour's blog on our website. Mm. We've just republished a report that Sam Lowe of um, Centre of mm. European Reforms done for us on trade, which basically makes a very clear case, and it's, I think, obvious mm. to some of us. Any of us heard Ted McKinney, um, the US mm. Department of Agriculture mm. Secretary, the first Oxford Farming mm. Conference after the mm. referendum, mm. and the United States is going to be mm. pushing for all kinds of deregulatory pressures um, on us and on agriculture. And so there are real risks um, if we do not say, if we are committed to high standards, we will write that into legislation that trade policy has to be conducted on that basis. So I think that's the first success criteria for me, is that we decide what kind of country we want to be as a nation now, and we go into our trade negotiations on that basis, and in which case we should reflect that in statute from the outset. So that's the first um, thing that I think would um, mean that I could look forward to a very promising future, whatever the specific outcomes are. The second one would then be around our agriculture um, policy and our agriculture bill. Um, you know, I think perhaps um, Manette and I particularly might take issue as to quite where the emphasis is in the Agriculture Bill. But to be totally honest with you, I, I think some of this is almost a bit of um, the means rather than the ends, in, in a sense that, that we're having a, a debate about. Because we are now going to need to justify to the taxpayer why an equivalent budget that is actually, I think, probably even exceeded now this time of year by the annual, just the annual operating deficit of the NHS is roughly the equivalent of um, the um, money we spend on agriculture. And so this isn't about um, how to slice the cake up, so whether there should be a cake at all. And so having an agriculture bill or agriculture act, and as you say, landmark what is the purpose in a modern um, complex world where land use performs many things as well as food production, I think having a very clear purpose that the reason for spending public money on agriculture is because of the public benefit mm. it delivers, the public goods as they're referred to, is absolutely central. And I think the risk is, if that clarity of purpose is lost out the bill, we're almost in danger of having a rerun of a CAP, a U, you know, CAP UK, as it were. Um, and I have to say, um, speaking to a number of colleagues and um, counterparts, I know Brussels, Germany, there's a lot of interest amongst people progressively who want to see the CAP reformed, that over the next five, six years, were we to have our own agricultural policy, next time the CAP comes up reform, they could actually point to something near neighbour and say, there you are, it works, there is an alternative. So they're very interested in the leadership we could show there. But anyway, that focus around public for mo money for public goods, another critical um, factor for our success as a country in the future. And the third one and final one is, again, um, the ability to have more policy coherence um, uh, because frankly the CAP has been a huge block on policy coherence at a European level. More policy coherence um, in terms of food and food strategy I think is absolutely crucial. It has to go way beyond um, an agricultural focused bill. Um, this is clear role for government and this is addressing things like health but also carbon. So you know, across um, lowland Europe, UK included, about half of our arable is used to produce livestock. Um, you know, it feeds cereals, feed livestock. There's a whole set of issues about diet. We are going to need to create more space for carbon sequestration, as well as, you know, fantastic, I mean, it is a fantastic commitment, you know, the, the, the vision you have 
decarbonising our agricultural sector, but actually the space is going to be needed to create for sequestering carbon as well. And so there's a whole set of things there, including our international footprint. So seeing a um, food policy that is able to speak to those agendas, I think, and, and again, sets a direction at a time we'll get past all of this immediate period and there's going to be a need of big debate in this country about how we bring the country together. And I think those three factors will be absolutely critical ones. OK, I'm going to thank you very much all our panel. So loads of big issues there about trade policy, about future food policy, about policy coherence, about how we regulate better, who does what in this new system. The IFG love for machinery of government changes. Uh, well, we're very interested in that. No, no one else really is. But anyway, uh, unless you work in one of the regulators. Um, so anyone got any questions or comments? We have some roving mics. Uh, Maddie, so let's just go to the lady. Joe, go to the lady there, and Maddie, go to the lady there. Yeah, and we'll take them in clumps of three. Um, thank you, that's very interesting. Can you tell us who you are? Um, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm Sue Davis. I'm from Which, the consumer organisation. Um, I really agree very strongly with the points that were made about taking this opportunity to have a much more joined up approach and obviously built on high standards. All the consumer research that we've been doing shows that consumers expect that we, well they assume we already have high standards and they expect that if anything after we leave the EU um, that those will be improved. I wondered how the regulator and the approach that Dame Glenis has been describing would fit with that. Because in the way that you were talking about its role in setting standards, you didn't mention anything about the importance of consumer protection. And ultimately, the reason why we obviously have agriculture and we produce food, from our point of view, mm. is that it's to meet our, our health needs. And consumers, therefore, have to be central. Uh, uh, central to that but if you've got this flexible approach and a very strong emphasis on the ability to respond and to facilitate trade isn't there a danger that that could actually work against that and that um, the consumer interest could be lost in that new approach okay don't answer yet we'll come on to that no. um thank you it picks up on a similar point really it seems to me that with um farming as with um so many other areas of uh policy there is a trade-off post-Brexit between how closely you remain tied into EU standards, rules, regulations, environmental measures and so on, uh, and the uh, extent that to which you have uh, access to EU markets. And just listening to what all of you have been saying about the, vi the vital need to maintain standards and the concerns about wider imports from other uh, non-EU countries, um, I just wonder whether what you're actually saying is that, in fact, in future, we're going to have to stay incredibly closely aligned, or are there really opportunities there where um, British farming could be liberated and could do things differently? Okay, and... I Sorry, Carol, I'm a political yeah. journalist, yeah. thank you. And just along there, just do that, and then we'll... Um, Robert Morland, I'm a, a former member of the European Parliament... And I have to say that my bias is very much in what I would call the which direction, because I'm surprised none of you use the word consumer. And I would have thought that the word consumer ought to be there the whole time, because it's not just consumer protection. I think most of my time in the European Parliament was voting against agricultural prices proposals because the prices were too high in the British government. So my interest in saying is what are you really doing for mm. the consumer? <coughs> and indeed, particularly a point that was touched on, the diet question, where the government has actually got mm. to face the fact that a lot of people eat too much. And also to be careful of, I'm entirely in favour of environment mm. expenditure. But environment expenditure that, that's there good for the environment and not to somehow deal, as I think some of it is, with farmers' incomes. Okay, some very interesting, uh, interesting points here. Let's just focus. I mean, are we in danger of having uh, what appears to be a consensus between environmentalists and farm producers uh, that actually uh, is forgetting the sort of consumer interest? I think someone on the radio this morning. Uh, singing the praises of unilateral tariff elimination by the UK was saying, well, 
Uh, I think he was talking about plates when I was listening to it. I think he talked about uh, food a bit earlier. But, uh, you know, the, there were 20,000 people employed in making plates, but 65 million people buying plates. I'm not quite sure how often people actually buy plates. I kind of last bought mine about 35 years ago. But, um, but, you know, there's sort of consumer interest in lower prices. And this interesting thing about, you know, um, high standards, is that a sort of closet form of protectionism, whatever. Minette, where do you see that balance being struck? How should we involve the consumer in these conversations rather than just be well, a sort of... I, yeah. I, 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 look, I, I think we all talked about the consumer. I mean, I, I talked about the 66 million people. Mike talked about this tacking mm. up for every taxpayer. However you want to term it, this, this has to stack up for, for British citizens across the board. Um, just to Sue's point, one, one of the frustrations that I have with the work that Glenna Stacey has done, and she knows my thoughts on this, is I, I believe it's a phenomenal piece of work, but it's not taken a vertical approach. So this is dealing with primary production. Um, we have massive challenges within the supply chain uh, of how we are trading. And the point that you made, Robert, so all these points are really interconnected. You know, you talked about not wanting environmental payments to prop up farmers' mm. incomes. Well, we face a challenge here because without direct support, 42% mm. of Britain's farmers become unprofitable. 17% of Britain's farmers are unprofitable right now with direct mm. support. So, so what do we do all about this? You know, we, we want to maintain the standards. There is a price to the standards. Um, and ultimately, somebody has to pay. Now, you know, we are the third per affordable amount of income spend. Consumers actually get a really good deal at the moment because, you know, there's only the US and Singapore that are actually offering their citizens a better deal on food price. So food is cheap. Farmers are taking effectively less than 6% out of the value chain. So we, we have to address all of this. So it has to be, to my mind, one big plan that stacks up for everybody. And what I would like Michael Gove to do, which he can do within the Agricultural Bill, is to take the upwards trajectory mm. on what Glenys has done with primary production and, and look at how government would look to maybe challenge competition law mm. to see how we would be trading. Because we are going to live with a retail price war, full stop. Mm. While we've allowed everybody to grow, we're just going to live with it. Um, so I think that is, is incredibly important. And, and the litmus test, as Mike says, will be on this standards point. I mean, that is the, the critical test. And Sue makes the point very well that consumers expect it. It's a given. And they do not see us leaving uh, as a threat to that at all. But that, that is the, the, the crux of all of this. So the appetite for lots and lots of cheap protein, you don't think exists because that's probably the area you get most cheap stuff coming in isn't it if we left the eu and went to unilateral tariffs you get it is about everybody else seeing this market as a massive opportunity for agricultural products um you know and, and the us in particular hmm. um so you know i'm not sure we've got in from the us embassy here do you see a couple of Ted, Ted McKinney couple has of very people, strong views a couple of people from the australian high commission who might want to come in and see whether they see us as an untapped uh, market in future trade deals. Glenn, do you, what do you see about this sort of oh, building yeah, out from your review and, and te maybe taking more of a consumer sort of interest in... in okay, so just in my defence, I wasn't asked to look at the whole world. <laughs> no, I think that, you, know, you should have been. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can you know, do that next. <laughs> it just, it started too, just have a anyway. quick look at inspections. So, you know, we have stretched yeah. the kind of yeah. terms of reference to the limit. But it is, you know, it's a valid point that, that Minette makes. I just had a couple of things to contribute. One is the consumer view and I, you know I'm a consumer we all are what do we actually know about the food we are eating and what do we care about it I found it enormously interesting looking at this as part of the review actually mm -hmm. what did people understand so we know we've got the food standards agency and there's a broad assumption that our food is safe to eat and if it isn't safe something will be happen about it so we want to know our food is safe then we want to know a bit about <coughs> the nutritional value of it is it worth eating mm. or, or, or is it not and you know we're somewhere on that and then if you go up this pecking order what we want to know when we talk about standards we might then want to know whether um, if it's an animal that it was well looked after that it had a happy <laughs> life or whatever it is. Uh, and then we might want to know about the environment and whether actually mm. producing this product had an adverse effect mm. on the environment but actually, most people, when they're looking at food on the shelf, and it'll have some sort of farm assurance label on it, have no idea, absolutely no idea what that label means. And I've asked a good number of people about that. And if it's got a red tractor or a, 
or a flag on it, we assume oh, it's made in England to some sort of standards, mm -hmm. which actually is, you know, we don't understand it. And so for me, you know, you, that is an undue level of complexity and opacity as well. You know, there is a strong case for transparency and for us being clear. You know, mm. what, what do we mean by standards mm. in their entirety? What do people really care about? What are they prepared to pay more for? So are they prepared to pay more mm. for outdoor pigs mm. and know that they were, you know, had, had a good life while they lived and mm. so on or not? And actually labelling our produce effectively. And of course, farm assurance is out with the remit mm. of regulation at the moment. And it does tend to be a proliferating sort of industry. And mm. I'm just curious about that as a consumer. So it's quite interesting, actually, whether your regulator should have some control about, actually, if you have an assurance scheme, you know, what is it saying to consumers? Would you say there's a role for your regulator? Or is that a different, no, is that trading inspectors? No, or it is a matter for government policy to decide, you know, where, whether they want to get any yeah. sort of grip on farm assurance at all. But let's say if I buy eggs, you know, eggs are such good value, maybe, 12p, 15p, depending on the size of the egg, and I know it's safe. I know that after the salmonella scare, the industry's worked so hard to get those eggs salmonella free, and I know that. But what I don't know is, you know, the effect of the environment of that poultry mm. unit. Am I concerned about it? If we're talking about standards in the <laughs> widest sense, I mm. ought to be, mm. because what we want from our land is not just eggs mm. that are clear of salmonella, but we want poultry units to be sufficiently well run that the impact on the environment is minimised. But at the moment, the so-called standards that we are mm. buying on aren't giving us any information about that at all. And, you know, it's just a curiosity to me. Mm. Mike, do you want to... Yeah, I'm just two, two quick points. I mean, I think the first, just to say, um, so, you know, a, a, as a charity, we have to look at the public benefit. You know, we don't think about consumer, we think about mm. public benefit. And the public, you know, they are consumers, they're also taxpayers, they're also citizens that actually expect their governments to ensure they're kept from harm as well. And so I'd look at it through all of those lenses. And, you know, if you then look at, say, how our land is managed and the key role that agriculture plays in that, you know, the public are affected by what happens in terms of air quality, mm. uh, ammonia emissions, for example, have a direct effect, floods, the carbon mm. cycle, you know, if we expect the rest of the world to help keep us mm. in a safe space, we've got to do the same. Um, that's going to be crucial. And of course, biodiversity, you know, the cost of pollinators, you know, that will directly affect consumers. If you take, you know, carry on taking out our pollinators, bees and others, the rate we are, it is going to put a massive cost and d dysfunction on how agriculture works. So, and, and you know, it's beyond my kind of brief, as it were, but I think also I would just make the point that I think, um, I think actually the, if you look at some of the evidence that I've seen out there, mm. how much reduction in price mm. we would see in food, I think is a, you know, moot point as just how much it would be. Mm. The point though is it would affect those in society where that marginal difference, mm. you know, the mm. ones who can least afford it. Mm. And, you know, and it's not just whether they can afford and will choose because they haven't actually got a choice, they can only afford the cheapest. Mm. But actually it's also around labelling as well, so whether they will be able to make a choice as well. Um, so I think there's a lot of reasons why there's a case for the public mm. to carry on funding um, what we do with our land. And, you know, the main tool of that is agriculture. And I think just sort of final mm. quick one, mm. but just going back to a point, um, you know, is there really opportunity if we're going to need to remain coupled to some degree with um, mm. the EU trading bloc? Mm. Um, I think there's a lot of, we have a lot of discretion as to how we might, um, if you like, our own public intervention in terms of spending. I think, you know, and I think there's a lot of scope there. We need to remind ourselves all the withdrawal agreement does is just get us to the conversation mm. about what that future is going to be. But I think I would work on the assumption that if we're broadly in the kind mm. of spending envelopes we are, um, effectively we've gone for massive modulation um, mm. uh, from where the CAP mm. is. We've shifted the balance, but it's broadly an equivalence that I think you know, allows us to at least have a trading negotiation. Yeah. Could I just say as well, yeah. I know, Minette, when we first met on this review, mm. you said to me, and it's always stuck with me, your members want to compete at all the price points. You know, and I mm. absolutely understand mm. that. And as consumers, we want to know those price points and what we're getting for our money. If I pay 59p for a bunch of spring onions or a pound for a bunch in a bag, is it the same spring onion? Answer, yes, it is. It's just had its roots trimmed off a bit. Well, then I know. At mm. the moment, you know, there's a lack of clarity to us consumers about what we're getting actually at the price points. They're not 
they're not strongly no. associated with standards yeah. as we recognise them. No. Okay, well, that's obviously an area we can do better. So we've got another round of questions. So let's, Maddie, let's come down here and let's go to then, and then we'll come to Barbara, and then we'll go and Joe. Yeah. Yeah, hello. Um, my name's Ian Wakeley, uh, agrarian peasant. Agrarian peasant. <laughs> I think that's a first for IFG. No one's ever introduced themselves as an agrarian present here before, so um, welcome. I'd like to make a few points, if I may. Um, firstly, I think one of the things that really, really depresses me as a farmer is the way certain politicians write this off, but it's just farming, it doesn't matter. Farming and food in this country employs 4 million people, puts 120 billion quid onto the UK's GDP every year. That's 10% of our GDP, give or take. And yet this is so often, politicians just wipe this away. Oh, it doesn't matter, it's only farming. That's point number one. Point number two, I'm a dairy farmer. I sell somewhere between 11 and 12,000 litres of milk a cow. In terms of efficiency, I'm pretty much there. Yeah. I can't come close to competing with one of my uh, uh, counterparts in the US because of all the problem, because of all the things they have, mm -hmm. like hormones they can use to treat to, 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 to uh, increase growth rates in the beef mm -hmm. byproduct of dairy cows, BST in dairy cows themselves, mm -hmm. rumen enhancing antibiotics in beef and dairy. Uh, the list goes on. Uh, now, if I'm to see free access to UK mm. markets of that sort of stuff. It doesn't matter why I have subsidies. It doesn't matter whether mm. somebody stands outside mm. Waitrose and say, yes, I'll give you an extra mm. 5p a pint, mm. I'm bust. And one of the things that people continually forget about with this, it isn't just what you mm. see on the supermarket mm. shelf. Mm. There's 20, 30% yeah. of all of the stuff mm. we produce goes into processing and processed foods and catering. Mm. And that American guy can do cheese 30% mm. yeah. a ton cheaper than me. Mm. That equates to yeah. tuppence on a pizza. Yeah. So you've just destroyed the UK yeah. dairy sector and somebody can save 2p on a pizza. Personally speaking, yeah. I don't think they'll ever see the 2p on the pizza. Yeah. I think that will wind up in Tesco's yeah. pocket. Yeah. That's by the by. <laughs> Secondly, mm. or thirdly rather, with regard to uh, some of the environmental problems we're speaking about. You speak about <coughs> uh, reducing emissions from livestock mm. and the ground that goes mm. to produce the food for the livestock. Well, even in an ultra-intensive dairy unit like I run, half my food comes from grass. You get rid of the cows, mm. To save, the, to save the ground that was ploughed mm. up to produce mm. the cereals to feed that. You also get rid of the grass that my cows mm. ate. Grassland is the biggest carbon sequestrator mm. we have out there to mm. use as a tool to help the environment. The idea that cutting back livestock production willy-nilly is going to make this any better mm. is bonkers. It's, it's just moving the problem mm. from one area to another. But it looks good because you can say, look what we've done. Yeah. As far as how food cheap should be, 1945, 80% of the weekly budget. 2019, 11% of the weekly budget. Most commodities, you could practically give the stuff away and it wouldn't make any difference to the process price in the shop. Okay, that's very helpful comment. It's really good to have somebody who's actually doing that. I know Minette's farming as well. Do you think you can pass the microphone just behind you, Barbara? Hi, Tell us who you are. Barbara Young. Um, I should say House of Lords and Chairman of the Woodland Trust, but I also ought to declare an interest in being an ex-Chief uh, Executive of the Environment Agency in view of what I'm going to say about Glenys <laughs> and her report. <laughs> um, um, I think two, th two things. One is I'm deeply, deeply, deeply nervous about the idea that any regulator can flex standards in order to aid trade, because we know in the past, the, the Common Agricultural Policy, which had a different set of drivers, often didn't allow the right sorts of biodiversity standards in particular, but also water quality, soil management, 
uh, flood risk management to be delivered by the farming industry. So we mustn't go from one system that's performed poorly for the environment to another system that performs poorly for the environment because, like it or not, the driver will always be trade if, we're, if we allow it to be. The second point I'm anxious about is the idea that consumers make rational decisions. Mm. I mean, we know that voters don't make rational decisions because they bloated, voted for bloody Brexit. <laughs> uh, um, and if you're asking everybody to do mini referenda every time they go around a supermarket on whether they buy X potatoes or Y potatoes on the basis of a complex mix of standards achievement, I think you know, we're barking up the wrong tree. The reality is government policy must set the standards for a whole variety of public benefits that then get delivered through a whole range of mechanisms, one of which might be regulation. The third question is a question rather than a rant, and that is... Um, we're anticipating farmers being regulated as an industry. But the reality of land use for the future could be quite different. You know, it could be multi-purpose land use. Now, I'm sure we're all hoping that much of the land management will continue to be done by farmers. But you could see a situation where, for example, due to the dearth of available timber that we have in this country, that the foresters get more of an upper hand. And so we could see not a regulatory system that's focusing on land, which is the main commodity, yeah. but on individual operators of the yeah. land. So we have somebody running a bit of land for farming. So do you want them to be able to get the Somebody running payments? a bit of land yeah. for forestry, and perhaps even sure. some company setting itself up as a carbon sequestrator yeah. or a natural flood risk manager or whatever. So I, I'm asking the question whether regulating for farmers is the right thing, or should we be regulating for land? Okay, that's a very good question. And let's go over there. Then we're probably getting more comments than questions at the moment, but anyway, yes. Graham Hudson speaking purely in my own personal capacity here. Um, I wonder what the panel think, thought in terms of the agricultural bill, whether it goes far enough in terms of bee harming pesticides and other chemicals. Pesticides, okay. So let's take those. I think the first question, Emma, do you think sort of government treats farming as important enough? I used to work in, work in DEFRA, which is quite interesting how nervous number 10 always appeared to be. I, we thought about anything uh, to do with farming, even under the Labour government, which when I was working there, seemed to be very cognizant, I thought, of, of farming concerns, even if uh, a lot of the time they may sort of ignore that. But... But it's quite interesting, I think, how some of the points being made about the sort of budget for farming, in a sense, mm. farming's been protected by getting the money coming through the CAP. Mm. You know, very different when DEFRA's got to fight its battle on its own mm. in successive planning <coughs> rounds. I just yeah. wonder whether you struck us that was a bit odd about quite a lot of farmers voting for Brexit, that maybe they didn't quite understand the uh, advantage there that they had. But well, you remember, Jill, the days when, when we lost agriculture out of the acronym. Yeah. Yes. Um, and, and you could say, we could all say it's a, it's a name, it, it doesn't really matter. But we were talking about it with the French yeah. yesterday that, you know, they said, what, can you tell us what DEFRA means, yeah. what, what it stands for? And, and, uh, and they were horrified at the end yeah. of it. They said, what, well, it doesn't say agriculture. Uh, and, but this is a big thing for the French as well, because agriculture is not a given and they have to fight to keep. Mm. Uh, agriculture mm. within the, the mm. acronym. That doesn't really matter, but, but the important thing is to keep um, politicians, mm. to keep a mm. government in touch with the land uh, and what is going on in the land. Now, I think under the CAP, it, if I'm honest, Jill, mm. I think we all defer mm. blame to Brussels. Mm. I think we did, mm. I think government did. We could all blame this big mm. bureaucratic beast for, for all the problems mm. that we had. And now all the chickens are coming home mm. to roost. So we will have to sort it out mm. ourselves. And it, it is going to lead to a new relationship and all the points mm. that have been made. And what I feel is, is really lacking at the moment is the sort of golden thread that runs from mm. health uh, or from education mm. to health to Bayes that mm. deals with business to DEFRA that deals with production. And if I speak to Bayes mm. ministers or Bayes officials, mm. they'll say, well, you're, you're DEFRA, you're primary mm. production, mm. you're not business. Mm. Mm. And I'm thinking, well, these are all businesses. Mm. You know, everything is fine business. So we mm. have to develop this mm. golden thread. We have to work in a way. And that'll be challenging. Mm. You know, there are going to be some challenging conversations to be, so you, to be had. 
So, Minette, you haven't mentioned the Department of International Trade in your golden thread, and yet a lot of what uh, our agrarian peasant friend is worried about is what DIT might be interested in doing in you know, trade agreements to land an agreement, if not exactly with the US straight out of the door with our Australian chums or with New the, Zealand or whatever. There is another conversation okay. to say, why would you have a Department of International Trade before you have agreed uh, your relationship with your primary trading partner? But look, that's, that's by the by as to whether Liam Fox should have a job or not. Uh, right, right now. But the point being, look for, for dairy, in, in all seriousness, you know we can't import liquid milk. Um, uh, you know, and, and thank goodness. So you know we need our dairy farmers. We've seen massive consolidation within the dairy industry, and we need to be able to add value to that liquid milk, which we've devalued now more than water, which is quite a remarkable feat. Um, so I think there are massive opportunities, if I'm honest, for dairy. But it will live or die effectively on this whole sort of standards mm. piece. Yeah. Fifteen percent of UK milk winds up in burgers, uh, cheeseburgers, pizzas, poor quality commodity mm. cheddar, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. that's the thing. If that fifteen percent mm. winds up mm. back on the UK dairy market. Not 20, 30 well, Sue, Sue Davis at the back yeah. will tell you when I was speaking of which, she'll say out of all their consumer research, you know, dairy and livestock are mm. iconic still within the eyes of consumers. Mm. They are very closely aligned with wanting to buy British dairy products. That's all a good thing. Mm. If I can, John, just yeah. have one point mm. on, on the, the assurance bit. Yeah. We all focus on retail. We're fixated mm. about it. Yeah. My members are mm. fixated on retail. It's all they ever talk about. And yet we all go out, we go to a hotel, mm. a bar, and mm. we couldn't give a, 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 a damn about what we're eating. We believe what it says on that blackboard. We believe mm. what it says on that menu. Mm. And we never question it. Mm. So retail assurance has been mm. a phenomenal success mm. story that we haven't taken mm. ownership of that I believe mm. we can now. But what about out of home? 50% mm. of our marketplace mm. is out of home and we're all guilty of A, how do we police mm. it? How do we have a code mm. of practice that is tied mm. into these standards? Um, and so you haven't got the policing, you haven't got the consumer. When I'm out in other countries, they'll immediately, if they come to mm. us, they'll say, what's in that sandwich? What's your procurement mm. strategy? Mm. You know, the French yesterday, the French sugar. Mm. Um, and they know about it. We don't have that in the UK and we need to develop it because ultimately the whole education piece mm. about understanding about food, your point about farming mm. not being recognised in government, mm. you know, procurement, mm. buying standards, those, those are important mm. cultural pieces that ultimately influence policy um, going forward. I wanted to come on to Glenis. So Barbara's challenge here yeah. that your regulator shouldn't be allowed to flex standards. Yes, this is bad for the environment. I'm going to ask yeah, Mike whether he's sanguine about the idea that we have a sort of regulator just making up standards yeah. to go along. Whatever. So there's a spectrum of ways in which you set standards. So at one end of the spectrum, uh, you would have a government doing that and setting them out in Acts of Parliament mm. and other statutory instruments. And you go right through various models to the other mm. end, which is a profession setting mm. its own professional standards and being totally in control of those. And at the moment where we are, generally speaking, for farming mm. is right at the government statutory legislative end of the spectrum. I think we identified about 175 different instruments, mm. some of them uh, many decades old, some of them really only coming into effect at the moment we have an emergency, which is mm. fine, but some of them terribly dated, actually. And then within there as well at the moment, there are a lot of provisions that are directly related to CAP mm. and cross-compliance and field measurement and, and all the rest of it. So assuming we come out of Europe, firstly, some of that's got to be unpicked. There's a really rather sort of tedious job of actually that you need to prioritise about what, of that un what still stays and what's unpicked. Mm. And you'll eventually get Acts of Parliament that shift some of it. But in the meantime, mm. farmers need to know. So, you know, there's a place there for someone to say, actually, you know, don't worry about these 68 mm. provisions. They're not relevant. You know, so you, there's a space for flexibility as we leave Europe and immediately beyond it. Secondly, in other regulatory spheres, different arrangements mm. exist. So, for example, in the regulation of qualifications, which I'm deeply familiar with, the regulator there does set standards. And it's very difficult, actually, to design a GCSE and to make sure it works and that you can be relying on those grades unless you talk to the exam boards about what works and what they can do. A simple example, if you want history coursework in there, you want to know they've got enough people who could mark it 
in a period of six weeks and mark it well mm. enough. And that depends on what subjects you have in that coursework, whether you have a word limit or not, whether they can bring... Ex all of that is relevant until you talk to the industry for a day and they'll say, well, actually, we haven't got markers or our, our marking mm. system won't allow us to put mark ranges of that. In other words, it's a t when you're in a technical business, having those trusting discussions mm. with those who will be asked to deliver about it really need to happen in one way or another. That is not going to happen in Europe. Mm. It's not necessarily, forgive me, going to happen in DEFRA necessarily in the future because you want those standards to be workable, to be accessible to people so that I on my farm understand what I'm being asked to do and why I'm being asked to do it. And you want them to have no adverse consequences. If I'm going to do that to make my milk a certain standard, I won't be able to sell my cheese or whatever it is. So that really, it's really important to get standards right and to express them well and to keep them under review. Uh, and yes, you know, trade considerations matter. So if government makes a decision about changing its trading terms, it may or may not have an effect on those standards. Now, I haven't said to government the regulator must set those standards. What I've said to government is you need to think about mm. how those standards are set mm. and there's an argument for saying mm. that the regulator should have some authority over those standards. If you want to be flexible and if you want those standards to be built in ways that work for farmers and actually sustain the industry but meet your aspirations for farming, <coughs> it isn't uncommon to ask the regulator to do it. And that's a, a, a matter for government now to decide how it's going to cut that cake, but it needs to move from the end of the spectrum it's at at the moment. Mm. I'm very certain of that. Okay, that's interesting. I'll we'll probably continue that conversation afterwards. This point about uh, pesticides. Are you happy with what's in the? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I think maybe I can even um, link, link all of them yeah. together because I think I would just first like to say, um, you know, farming is a very big part of what my organisation does and does with others, and there's a reason for that, mm. and it's because it's absolutely vital to maintaining a lot of the natural mm. heritage and mm. natural functioning we have. Um, within the UK. So, um, you know, I don't see that this is not a question, is there a future for farming? It's what can the future, how do we make that a positive future going forward? Um, and I think in that context, we do have to recognise, and I think it's arguable before we went into CAP, um, and, you know, sort of go back a hundred years, actually, the village I live in, it wasn't just food products mm. that were coming off the mm. land, it was a whole range of things mm. that were coming mm. off the land, you know, many of which wouldn't be regarded mm. as you know, mainstream agriculture now. So I think we do need to think about mm. land use in the round. Mm. So I have to say yeah. I've got a lot of sympathy for what Barbara's saying. And I, I, you know, I, I think um, you know, there's more than the transactional relationship of the yeah. state yeah. And, the re yeah. you know, and, and the farmer and yeah, yeah. in regulation. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I fear that we've, we need to do more about thinking of form follows function yeah. and what the regulatory yeah. objectives are. Yeah. And that's you know, just the bit that I, I would take issue on. And, and linking into that, I think um, you know, look, one of the things here in terms of pesticides, because yeah. this is dynamic, we need dyna you know, standards do not stay the same when you're looking at env the environment, for example, mm. um, or, or public safety in terms of chemicals, mm. it is dynamic. And two very important principles we currently operate to are the precautionary principle, evidence-based regulation, and also the um, polluter pay. So things like neonicotinoids, mm. huge debate, but the point about that, it's a debate about what is the evidence telling us, and the evidence but you know, will, will, will develop over time, one way or another. Um, but that's how it, sh how it should be. And so I think that's where, um, frankly, at the moment, I think we, are, I'm, I'm unclear as to how, what the government's strategy is here in terms of future regulation. Because I think we're at the point of creating a mixed economy, where on the one hand, we've got enabling legislation like the Agriculture mm. Bill, but on the other, we might be just opening ourselves up to imports and it will be kind of catch as catch can, the consumer will decide which actually dominates in terms of public, you know, expression of public policy. And that is why I think we need to make sure some of these principles are enshrined. Mm. So if you want to ensure we have the appropriate standards for, say, pesticides, control of um, uh, animal pests or whatever, I think that's why we do need what we're echoing, mm. which is we need to have those safeguards written into legislation to say our trade policy will honour the standards that we wish to apply in the future in the UK. It's quite interesting because there's a big regulatory battle on whether you align on science-based regulation, what the yeah. US, Canada, Australia yeah. would say they do, as opposed to precautionary principle, 
sort of well, EU I mean, the precaution, super risk averse? Uh, 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 well, uh, uh, do you think? Uh, uh, I, I think that's, a, that's not how I would how I would describe uh, either. And you, you've right. got to ask yourself the question. I think there's huge commercial interest elsewhere in the world at the regulatory domain that we're currently yeah, within. Good, good, good. And you know, and I, you know, it's interesting which way is China mm. going, which way is African mm. trading bloc going mm. in terms of looking mm. at things like precautionary. How it operates in practice mm. is another thing. But I think um, you know, it, it's in, if you start with we wish to ensure there's public mm. safety. Mm and environmental safety, then I think it's, it's, it's a very important part of the architecture we've got. Only have to look into, say, hazardous chemicals under reach yeah. legislation, for example. Can I just say, yeah. Jill, I think one of the issues there with the proposal that we have a statutory provision saying that our standards will be aligned in, yeah. is that the parliamentary draftsman will go bananas about that, because what does that actually mean? How is that subsequently interpreted? When we say standards, what does that mean? And aligned, what does that mean? And I suspect that is quite an obstacle, actually, to getting such, you know, those terms hard, hard edged and concretized into an act of parliament. It may be an ambition, it may be government policy and aspiration, but it's how you actually, I imagine the parliamentary draftsman really going a bit, you know. Okay, I'll let's just, that. okay, we're coming to the end, and I know lots of people have had to go already, so let's just pick up final questions and then very quick answer to our panel. So we'll go just behind you, Maddie, there, and then we'll go here, and then we'll go, yeah, we'll just pick very quick questions, one sentence questions. Yeah. Um, Adam Bell from DEFRA. Uh, CAP has been reformed successively over the yeah. years. Today it doesn't look anything like the CAP of the early 90s. <laughs> And there's a lot of different mm. approaches other countries mm. have made. Norwegians are different. The Canadians do their mm. own thing on insurance and so forth. Are there historic reforms in Europe or the approaches that other countries have taken to agriculture that we should be looking to and getting inspiration from? Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Jill. Um, uh, Stephen Dietz from the Australian High Commission. Um, thanks for, <laughs> for outing us. <laughs> um, uh, but very much appreciate the talk. Uh, very, very interesting. Um, uh, I just want to make a couple of points in response to uh, uh, mentions, <coughs> mentions to Australia. I mean, those who would, uh, ha would have seen the, our High Commissioner at King's College last week or our uh, Trade Minister in town the week before would have heard him say that, um, uh, of course, Australia realises that there are, there are sensitivities in the FTA discussions, mm -hmm. but that, you know, uh, the fastest growing markets uh, in the world lie on Australia's mm -hmm. doorstep in Asia. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've had a very successful track record of negotiating free trade agreements with China, Japan, Korea, uh, and just recently the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and, and that's where we see the, the biggest growth in particular for agricultural exports. Um, that's not to say that Europe and the UK is uh, insignificant or an unimportant market for us. Uh, we are currently negotiating an FTA with the EU, you'll be aware. Uh, and of course, uh, our government is quite keen to uh, commence FTA negotiations with the UK when it leaves the EU. Um, so it, it, it's certainly uh, recognised that there will be um, sensitivities as there, as there are in all FTAs, uh, FTA negotiations to resolve uh, and create, I guess, a sense of trust, uh, in particular in the agriculture uh, side and it's understandable I think that there is not a sense of excitement in the uh, UK agriculture industry at the moment uh, on that front but uh, I think we see the task ahead of us as, as engaging with UK agriculture uh, on all of the potential opportunities that are there including on um, sharing Australia's experience uh, in particular on, on subsidy policy where we've taken a kind of uh, research and development uh, approach to, to assist with competitiveness on standards where in fact sometimes uh, in some areas uh, Australia's standards are, are higher than the, the UK's so I don't think it's uh, necessarily the case that, that uh, trading with Australia would involve lowering okay. standards and in any event you know we, we export to the standards of the market to which uh, exports are bound. Um, so we look forward to a, to a <laughs> long uh, uh, conversation and, and ongoing engagement on this uh, and we'll look forward to a point where uh, there's excitement upon the uh, excitement. We'll ask, we'll ask Minette how excited she is about Indeed. Frosted. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Indeed. FDA. Um, down, yes, there and then, mm. yeah. Uh, David McLeod, a question for uh, Damon Glennis. Um, what percent of the benefits that you'd like to see through regulatory change are held back by EU membership. Oh, 
gosh. No, right, that's a very good quick question. Just do your sums now, Glenis. And final question down here. Sorry, Agent Hogarth, I, I am the parliamentary draftsman that Dame oh, Gladys oh, mentioned just now. She's quite right. Um, I think my question would be if you, had a fr if you had a free amendment to the Agriculture Bill, what would it be? You allow one free one. One? F What's a free one? Does that mean. Well, you don't have to give anything. All oh, right. You don't have to pay parliamentary draftsmen for it. So, Minette, a quick question on these two questions, actually, interestingly combined. Uh, are your members all keen for the UK? Australia's sort of like number one of Liam Fox's sort of top three places he wants to do a trade mm. agreement with. Uh, Stephen convinced you there's loads to be learned. And actually, there's a really interesting question about where might you look at other reforms. So obviously, Australia and in particular New Zealand, when I was at DEFRA, we were always looking at New Zealand, not least uh, their sort of uh, model for cost sharing on animal disease, which was always very attractive to various people after uh, they had reformed their agriculture sector big time when they lost access to our markets after we joined the common market. Mm. Yeah, where are you looking for lessons for an adaptive farming sector? Um, well, look, I, I wish our Australian friends the very best of luck with <laughs> Asia, China, <laughs> Japan and Korea. <laughs> Um, look, we're, we're Commonwealth um, countries and, and, and they're great friends of ours and, and the Australians are not quite as charming yet as the New Zealanders, but the New Zealanders have <laughs> been charm personified forever and a day and, and speak to us on a regular yeah. basis. So look, we, we, we have a lot to share, um, but we, we, are incredibly, we are incredibly different yeah. um, in that we're such a densely populated country. You can compete on scale in a way that we can't. You have very challenging weather. Um, and, and all sorts of, of other things. But the, I'd like to link your point back to the, the, um, the where are the opportunities and what would we learn now from, from other countries. And, you know, when I look at how other countries have invested the CAP, you know, when I look at countries like Denmark, who've been totally focused on, on productivity, for instance, and there is a reason why Denmark's productivity figures are very different to ours, because they've invested the cap very differently. Um, so, you know, when I speak to the Danes, they will say we have 28 people across the world who are selling the benefits mm. of Danish agri-food. So they are a big exporting nation. Um, they are very much bought into Danish agricultural production and the opportunities. The UK has one person in China who's just retired. So, you know, this sort of myth that we have these massive export opportunities, we do, but they were alive to us yeah. in Europe, Jill. You know, so we've been under-exporting agri-food for a long time. There is an opportunity now for us to really come together and do it differently. And, and I do believe, you know, the British brand should be underpinned by assurance, integrity and standards. You know, Michael Gove can effectively mm. call it whatever he wants mm. to call it. But we need to come together. We need to be focused on the home market and the export market. Um, and, and I think there are big lessons to learn from countries like Denmark, who've really worked mm. with their farmers mm. to promote the Danish mm. brand uh, across the world. That was within our gift, mm. and we haven't used it. And, and how we spend, this is mm. why I say what I say mm. around net zero, because this has to be a big, inclusive mm. plan. You know, it can't be, and the danger is that it becomes environment versus food versus agriculture. It's got to be one plan that comes together. And whether Sally Davis, mm. as chief medical officer, is out in Doha, you know, she referenced Red Track Assurance as, as having done a great mm. job in delivering mm. on antibiotics. We all need to be on the same message. Whatever that message is, if she's out in mm. Doha, or I'm here, or, you know, whoever else is, is anywhere in the world, they need to be on the mm. same British brand message. And that's what Denmark and other countries have achieved within the European mm. structure. That's really interesting. Now, let's just go quickly to Glenys. Have you done your sums for David? Uh, sort of. Just on that point, can I say that I always advise ministers to be careful about policy shopping in other countries. You can look and mm. learn, but every country is mm. different. Yeah. Um, so... I'm sure the burden will reduce, but I can't quite quantify it in the neat way that you would wish. But what I can say, first of all, is that we shouldn't be measuring fields. So if the proposals that I make in my review are followed through, we won't be doing that. And a good amount of regulatory effort goes into that, the frustration of farmers. And the bigger the farm, the more fields, the more measurement and so on. So that is the most irritating part of the immediate face of regulation for farmers, I think, and that, that should go. Secondly, there are, associated with that, there are cross-compliance penalties. 
you know, we as a country have put a fair amount into the cross-compliance bucket, actually, uh, because it's been convenient. Uh, that needs to go as well, because cross-compliance can be unfair, and it doesn't stand up as a sensible modern-day regulatory approach. So, in a way, whatever the burden is, it should be fairer. So enforcement should be uh, across a broader spectrum uh, and work in a more consistent, fair and way, and one in which farmers who wish to comply are given, given the chance to comply. And then lastly, I don't think it's unimportant. What I'm suggesting is that the regulator should be able to provide advice to farmers and possibly do men benchmarking for farmers mm. using some agreed, albeit crude, or uh, proxy metrics. And so some of the so-called burden mm. as between the farmer and the regulator might actually be beneficial. Okay, Glennis, final question. What's your amendment to the Agriculture Bill? Oh, create a regulator. Create, create a regulator. <laughs> Mike. Dear Parliamentary um, Draftsman, please leave in for Christmas the amendment proposed by the EFRA Select Committee saying that imports into the UK should be only if they meet the standards that apply to UK managed production. And if I'm very good, please can we also have the clause for a multi-annual framework during the transition period? Okay, Minette, final well, I, I'm rate. taking the first three I mentioned as a given, so I'm adding, <laughs> I'm adding my fourth. <laughs> Which is that you know we take the approach that we have done uh, with Colonel mm. Stacey and we take the vertical approach and, and really look at this as, as a whole chain mm. approach because that is crucial to the success. Okay, maybe DEFRA can be renamed the whole chain department or whatever. If you don't like DEFRA as a DEFRA as a name, anyway, thank you all very much. Thank you very much to Dame Glennis, to Mike, to Minette. That was really really interesting. Really loads and loads of really interesting themes. The Institute for Government, as well as specifics on food and farming policy, trade, regulatory policy, machinery of government burdens of regulation, loads and loads of great stuff there. Thank you all very much for coming. Do come more, and if you want to recommend this to all your friends. It's on the live stream and people can watch the video afterwards and see all of you. Don't think anyone said anything they don't want to think. So could you just thank our panel very much? <laughs> and if you're a glutton for punishment tomorrow morning at, uh, at 9 a.m., we're discussing how has Brexit changed Parliament uh, forever, for good, for bad or whatever. So do join us there. Thank you very much. Thanks.